Welcome to the Idea Land Podcast, hosted by Ravi Kamati Reddy. If you've ever dreamed of becoming a filmmaker, meet Craig Packard. Craig is a writer, director, and producer known for the short films The Cost of Things and Bobby Ellis is Gonna Kick Your Ass. We talk about building the confidence to direct and how every film is a masterclass in collaboration. His current project is a Western in pre-production called This Bloody Country. What's going on, brother? First of all, welcome to Idea Land, this episode. Tell us what you're doing, what you're currently working on, and how you got to this point. Sure. I am uh, in the process of producing a feature film that I wrote and will direct. It's called This Bloody Country. It's a Western, and it concerns a Mormon family in the late 1860s who are being guided from Salt Lake City. Originally, it was going to be into Idaho, but now it's and now they're going into Arizona, and I'll, I'll explain that why that is later. But essentially, this, the story hasn't changed. So they're being guided by this Australian person who's a, a guy with sort of a rough background. Uh, he's, he's basically been a hired gun the entire time he's been in this country. That seems Australian yeah. in the Western, doesn't it? That just seems like it fits. That seems yeah, well, not out of place. There's a story behind that, as, as with everything. So he's guiding them from Salt Lake City into Arizona Territory and trouble ensues. They encounter some bandits and they have to get a little creative in order to survive because they're convinced that the, the bandits will come back after the, the initial encounter in which uh, the Australian guy whose name is Ned kills two of them and the Mormon patriarch whose name is Josiah intervenes and allows the third bandit to get away. So Ned is convinced that the guy who got away is coming back and he's bringing reinforcements. And because this this party is made up of, of mostly women, it's the, the Mormon patriarch, his three sister wives and four children, they have a certain vulnerability as a result of that, that um, is sort of assumed by the bandits. And so there's sort of this power struggle that ensues between Ned and Josiah along the way where Ned is trying to keep them alive and, and Josiah is feeling his, his position threatened by this guy. And, uh, you know, mayhem ensues. But uh, how did this come about it was part of the question? Is that yeah, right? I really, the story is, sounds so good. It sounds like it's obviously, it's been put together by you so well, and you've obviously thought about it. However, I'm really interested in how you came up with this particular structure of characters and story in this setting, because you've made some really interesting choices with the religiosity and the, the family itself and the power play between the two characters. How do you even come up with something like this? Where does it start? This is a, this is an interesting question. Uh, this one actually came about through a character in a way, and it was the character of Ned. And I wrote it with uh, an actor friend in mind who happens to be Australian. And I just thought, um, let's not try and make him do an American accent for the entire film. And this was, um, Originally, it was intended to be a no-budget feature that we were going to do. We were going to go out into eastern Washington and shoot it for $50,000. Really, nobody was going to get paid. That's, that just covers like feeding everybody and transportation and lodging, that sort of thing, for your cast and crew. And it would have been a bare-bones kind of affair anyway. So I wrote this character for, for this friend who had been in a couple of films that went to Sundance and did well. And he's an older guy. Uh, at the time, this is about five years ago. He's probably about sixty-five. And I, the character originally was made spiritual cousin to the to uh, Clint Eastwood's character in Unforgiven. So, mm-hmm. kind of a guy who's 
been through it all, seen it all, caused a lot of trouble, hurt a lot of people, and now he's sort of bearing the this, this spiritual weight of, of all that violence. And uh, as soon as I came up with that character, then I needed to put him into a setting. And I don't, I don't remember the genesis, but I remember thinking I, I've never seen... Uh, I had the idea for the Mormon family with the sister wives, and I, I immediately yeah. thought, I've never seen that. I've never seen that in a film. And it makes for a, an interesting dynamic. So he's a stranger to them, and they're obviously strange to him. Their customs, their uh, family structure, and all that sort of thing. So you put these people together who ordinarily wouldn't choose to be together, who don't belong together, who, who have different philosophies or just different lifestyles, they effectively have to rely on one another in order to survive. And to me, that was really interesting already, right? And so once, you know, I had a character I liked, I put him into a scenario that I liked, and then, you know, I let the character, I sort of let the the story go where it wanted to go in a sense. And then, you know, I wanted to keep it pretty simple because I wanted to be able to shoot it myself very cheaply. And so I intentionally set it all outdoors. They're already on the journey when we start the film, which kind of, it does two things. I don't like a lot of backstory and explaining in stories. And the other thing is, is the story is already in motion when we arrive. So you're catching it. We're catching up in the middle of something that's already happening. Yeah, they're already in their journey, and in fact, it starts with them putting a, a child in, into the ground, bearing a child, which sort of, from the very beginning, it, you get a sense that this is a rough journey. And, it's Oregon and, Trail in real life. It's actually yeah, yeah actually people, really sucks. It's really hard. You yeah, can't yeah, reset. It's just it's just a miserable thing. I mean, these are people wearing you know they're not wearing gore-tex and and hiking boots and they're, they're right. going hundreds of miles right i haven't done that you haven't done that no one you know has done that no it's just an unbelievably difficult thing on its own so the story starts at the beginning of the story it's um well what is that like and we get to see a bit of just the hardship of that and then i tried to kind of lull i mean the, the idea was to kind of lull the audience into a Oh, this is just a story about you know the hardship of this kind of a trip, and then these these bandits arrive, and there's a there's a violent scene, and then we're sort of thrust into this different kind of movie that that really starts to accelerate. You're so right when we, when you said like we we don't do that. It's the hardest thing I've ever done is like have to make a reservation with an airstream trailer at, at a place to, to a place yeah. to park it and then complain that we're not getting the dates we want. Uh, if you think about it, that era is so crazy of a setting because there's so many challenges you could use, right? So the sure. bandits and just the idea that you're prey at some level as you're, mm -hmm. as you're doing the worst road trip ever. And then at the end of that road trip, <laughs> some level of what you have to do is construction. It's like, if you think about it that way, like, wow, that sucks. Yeah. It's like, oh yeah, find well, your- The other thing is like, when you leave, there's no going back to get, oh, I forgot the, whatever yeah. it's you know if you were going to take a, a long backpacking trip you're taking what you need for the trip well they're taking what they need for the trip but they're also taking everything they own yeah and if they leave anything too bad it's gone you're you're gonna have to build it when you get to your destination and one, one of the really interesting things is that the story goes to this place where ned eventually realizes the only chance for us to survive is to, to teach the women to shoot in a hurry. Yeah. And and hope that, that the bandits will bring just enough people to kill the men and, you know, do whatever they want with the women, which is probably not good. And they won't expect that there will be three more people shooting. And there's, there's sort of this absurd idea uh, that at that time that women don't do this sort of thing. Women can't do this sort of thing within a story in which they're traveling 500 miles overland on foot. So these women could do this extraordinarily 
difficult, arduous thing that, that most modern women will never, most modern women or men will never do, but somehow they couldn't handle pulling the trigger. That was a, there was a sort of this sexist blind spot that the, that particularly Josiah, the, the, the Mormon patriarch has towards his, you know, these, these women who are so important in his life. They can do this one incredibly difficult thing, but this other thing is just beyond them because they're the fairer sex. It's, it's a silly idea, right? And on some level, you know, you don't make uh, period pictures to talk about that time. You're you're actually talking about now and the stuff that we're still dealing with. And it, you know, in, in, in this story, it's it's you know, sexism and it's violence and, and those things haven't gone away. I don't, you know, I don't know if it's as sexism as I would say it is, is, is I, I don't know. I, I, it's interesting. I wonder back then if you had said, or someone had said, uh, well, this guy is just as good at raising kids as a woman and also be laughed at as equally like, well, there's no way a guy could do that. They can't handle the stress of kid. I don't know. Right. So I, it's like, right. you, they definitely just fall into these roles, which brings me to the, the point, a larger point here. You know, I once saw Brad Bird talk about animation and he was like, he says something really interesting. He goes, you know, I hate when people talk about animation as a genre. He's like, it's not a genre. It's like, it's a style, but this, it's, it's just a style to tell the story. What are your thoughts about that when it comes to this Western setting? Why did you choose this one? Because I feel like it's, it's the Westerns, are they really a genre? Or are they just, no, just another setting for you to tell these stories? You know, how much time do you have? But I mean, we can go on about that for some some length. It, it, in one sense, the Western film is kind of the, the American's true art form along with jazz, I think. Scorsese says the gangster film, but the gangster film, I, I think, is a you know secondary, actually, to the, to the Western film. And, You're right. West, I guess musicals, although let's not talk about music. No, I'm kidding. But not the biggest fan. You know, for a long portion of the history of cinema, at least in this country, in America, Westerns were a huge, huge portion of, of what was done. And part of that is, is you know, myth-making of this country and that sort of thing. But yeah. that, that has been taken to many countries around the world. And, you know, a samurai film is essentially a Western, for instance. You know, Akira Kurosawa's favorite filmmaker was John Ford. And he made an awful lot of westerns. Uh, in fact, one of the best, uh, Seven Samurai, is is a western, and it's been remade as a western. Yeah. It's a, you know, it's a, a samurai. It's a Japanese film about samurai guys. But really, I, so I am sort of fascinated with the western. I'm not in love with it. It's not like all I want to do is make western films. And and it, on a certain level, I don't actually give a damn about genre. I think genre is um, it's a it's a made up thing. It's a way of uh, making sense of a thing that exists. It's it's like famously, film noir isn't really a thing. It was a thing that was named by these French critics years after watching right. all these American crime films. They were like, oh, there's this there's these commonalities with these films, and they gave it a name. Well. Those filmmakers weren't making film noir because they wouldn't have known what the hell that was. They were just influenced by other filmmakers, the German expressionist filmmakers and the, with the dramatic lighting and this and that. But so on a certain level, genre doesn't matter to me at all. In fact, uh, I did not think about this as a genre film as I was writing it. I didn't. In fact, I avoided. You no, know, you could make a western and, and intentionally try to include as many tropes as possible. I, I didn't want any of that. I, I just saw it as a story yeah. and I was aware that because of the setting, because of the time, and there are guns, you know, and horses, uh, it's a Western. And, you know, you can't get away from that. It, it is. And it's yeah. just an, what it becomes is an easy way to talk about it and people will understand what you're talking about more quickly than if you just... I mean, if I describe the story to you, eventually you're going to say, oh, it's a Western. 
That's right. Yeah. Sure. What, what I think is also interesting about it is because the Western, because of the landscapes themselves um, and the, the type of action that usually happens dictates a, a certain film language too, right? I mean, so it's, I was talking to one of my friends about this project and he's a, he's a DP and he goes, oh my gosh, they're doing a Western. It's like every DP wants to do a Western. So what is that Correct. about? Like, what is it about the actual uh, art of filmmaking? That's so interesting to filmmakers, uh, where they want to have it in, as part of their repertoire. Well, I, I mean, I, 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 that is a very natural response for a DP to have, and it's because they're photographers, and a Western is going to be taking place, ideally, in a setting where the, the, the setting becomes a character in the story, in effect. Because, you know, in a way, this is a road picture, and the landscape is one of the one of the obstacles yeah for you know keeping them from safety and i think a big part of why people watch movies is is take me somewhere i've never been before take me somewhere interesting and westerns uh for a lot of the world this was how they saw america for a long time they saw it oh cowboys you know the monument valley valley and arizona and uh, tombstone and all, all that sort of thing and um, so I think actors, really, especially older male actors, <laughs> which our two leads are, uh, really get excited about, especially if they've never done a Western before. I think a lot of actors are like, man, I want to do that because it's one of those things. It's like checking a box of, of you know, bucket list kind of thing for an actor. Craig, I would love to do it, but there's no <laughs> Indians in the Westerns. You, you play, you play this, you know, you play these these roles as kids oftentimes growing up yeah um we do have one indian but he's uh, he's not south asian <laughs> <laughs> yeah he's the other indian that's a different movie and you know i'm i'm sure i'm sure i'm sure that needs to be told the, uh, i'm sure there's a story there indian in the west you know that there are so many questions I would have for that stuff. It's like, how did you, <laughs> what are yeah. you doing out here? It's Much probably more than the Australian, maybe. It, knowing Indians, it's like setting up the general store, selling, selling something, you know, sell, and doing probably pretty well yeah. at it as well. Probably, yeah. So I, I'll bet you there's some kick ass Bollywood movies that are essentially Western. We should but look they're just set, in, they're set in India. We should look that up. I'm actually curious. And that's the thing about the but setting. There are, there should be there, sh there i'm sure there are and some just amazing stunning musical numbers that that happen <laughs> on top of a train or something like that i mean you know it it has to be yeah it's a, there's trains so it's, i tried to get that into my my film but i couldn't work it i just couldn't i couldn't find a place for it you know but you the did musical number. but you you did i would say it's a gutsy move and a prickly subject to introduce any religiosity or to represent a group, even despite that it's a fictional setting and that you're trying to make a point and tell a story and and in mm -hmm. allegory and things like that. I would say it's pretty gutsy with the Mormon thing. So, what was your approach to handling handling that? Um, you know, it's funny because initially I thought I, I'm not gonna I'm not ever gonna use the word Mormon. I'm never gonna say that they're Mormons. But obviously, you know, people are gonna get that who they are and what they're, where they are and what they stand for and that sort of thing. But I never set out to tell the Mormon story. And this is not that story. This is a story that involves some characters who are Mormon. Hmm. And my, my approach to that was always to give them their full humanity as much as possible, to not judge them, to not make fun of them, but just to treat them as ordinary people with, with, uh, you know, ordinary, they want to live, you know, it's in this, in this story, it's pretty simple. They want to survive. They want to see their, their children survive. You know, I think that's a pretty universal yeah. sort of thing. I initially, I think I was, I, I was afraid I might offend. And what I've discovered is, and I've had a couple of Mormon folks read it and I, I guess is even the right terminology these days, LDS, um, read it and I ask them, have I done anything offensive? Have I done anything just wrong? And it, on both counts, I, I guess it, 
you know, it, it passed muster. Actually, I think three Mormons have read it now. Um, and they, to a person, they were all sort of interested at the very least. I, I think they were cautiously interested in oh, how are we being portrayed because they've been beaten up in the media quite a bit. And I, I have no, I have no axe to grind with this story. I'm not trying to put, put these people down and I'm not trying to present them as, you know, anything better than anybody else. No, there's interesting um, ingredients in a, in a recipe that would be Sure, yeah. They're, they're people, and this is who they happen to be in this in this story, and I, I, I thought, you know, it makes for an interesting juxtaposition, so I didn't want to didn't want to let that go once I got a hold of it. But yeah, initially I, I sort of avoided, I guess, identifiers. Like, I, I didn't include, in the first draft, I didn't include the, uh, the, the Mormon hand cards. And I had a conversation with a friend and I said, I think, I think this is going to be, I'm going to need to explain it to people or something. And he said, no, no, I, I, that is really interesting. That, you know, that fact that they carried their gear, not pulled by oxen or, or mules or what have you, but pulled by, by people. And, you know, as I did my research, I, I learned that this is a thing that, that they're very proud about, that this is, they, they I'm reenact this. I'm this not fa day. familiar with this. Fill me in here. Hand carts? So, so there was, um, in their westward, uh, expansion migration yeah this was a way of, of um, doing things e economically they built their own carts they were two-wheeled carts with a sort of like a yoke across the front that that oftentimes uh, young people and women would would be the, the ones pulling them and they just loaded all the gear in it so if you imagine a uh, sort of foreshortened uh, wagon that that has no front wheels and no animals pulling it and they do reenactments of this to this day and it was kind of a debacle actually because a lot of people died on the way but that had to, that I'm had more this to do with the trip that with you know that the the timing of it the they got caught in snow and and you know mormons were uh, they went through a hell of a lot they were driven out of one place after another after another um, you know, their leaders were killed. Apparently in, I think in Arizona, it was still legal to shoot a Mormon until like the 80s, what? 70s, something like that. Yeah, yeah. It was on the books. Uh, you, you, could, you could kill a Mormon and, and it was state sanctioned. Uh, of course, that was probably not really uh, functionally doable, but uh, it was on the books yeah, until yeah, very late. Yeah, it was a relic of, it was a, it was a relic like a, of something stupid that wasn't corrected over the years, which is ridiculous. Yeah, and they, I mean, there just there just was a, a lot of animosity toward these toward these folks, and and you know they were sort of ridiculed for even attempting this, and you know the, the fact that people died w was sort of proof that it was such a silly thing for them to do. But people died on the westward trail, no matter what they did, because it was just a bloody hard. Trip. I was making fun of that game earlier, but I'm kind of half kidding. You know, it's like it's like the the dumb simulator game that we all played as kids. I mean, the Oregon Trail. It's like you know, you, yeah, you step, you get bit by a snake, you're yeah. done. Like, it's it's a, the, right. the smallest infraction into of, of health at all could turn into something just you know um, catastrophic. But sure. but yeah. but like your story is outlining. I mean, there are people lying in wait. You know, bandits and stuff. And I wonder. It, it's just the idea of ar having to arm yourself and protect yourself is so ingrained deeply in America, and you can probably draw a line directly back through the generations to this, right? This westward expansion. I mean, this is. These are. I was just thinking about these are places we just drive through in a couple hours now, and it, it's just amazing to think that people had. It actually had to expand through wilderness and contend with the, the natural elements, but also the most dangerous thing there, which was people lying in wait. How much people, yeah. research did you have to do or did you do while you were writing this? And how long did it take you to write this? It, so I wrote it about five or so years ago. And I, like I said, I wrote it with the intention of, of doing it cheaply and, and took a took a stab at it and you know the nature of making movies is even even making a movie for no money is really really difficult and we sort of ran out of time before we 
made it happen. It's hard for me to remember exactly. I, I, I think it took me... So my, my process is I spend a lot of time outlining before I ever write. So the actual writing is relatively quick. Um, like I can, if I've done all my work, I can write a script if I have enough time and the freedom to do so, I could write a script in a week. This one took wow. a little longer. I remember it being difficult because it, it's a, <laughs> weirdly, it's a relatively simple story, but I wanted there to be enough there that you got some complexity of what was going on. Um, and there's, there's, it's a funny thing. You know, people think you just start writing and you write until you get to the end. And, and some people work that way, but generally you need to know where you're going before you start going, like any kind of journey. So it, it wasn't until I got really clear on the theme of the story that, that it all fell into place. So it, it was, it, but it was a, it was a tough it was one of the tougher bits of writing I've done. And sometimes it just flows and it feels easy. Well, this was this was a little tougher. What was the hardest part of it? I think it was it was feeling like so for a film to to hold your interest, it has to feel like it's driving forward. So one scene necessitates the next scene. It's sort of and then what? I mean, and then what happened? It's, it's, you want to, you want to generate that kind of, you know, your viewers interest of, of wanting to know what's going to happen next. And, um, because this was essentially ostensibly one setting, I, I, I was afraid there was going to be too much of a sameness to it. Now, once we've had a, had a chance to scout our locations, which is a, another topic, um, it's we're planning on shooting in, in southern uh, Utah, which is actually pretty close to where the story is set. And once once we scouted the locations, not only is there not a sameness, it's unbelievably diverse, and and just anywhere you look is interesting. And and there's a variety of difficult landscape to to navigate. So. I, I think, yeah, I think I was struggling with, uh, does this feel like nothing's happening? Right. And keeping that forward momentum going was, and keeping the tension of, uh, you know, there's something bad is going to happen if we don't do, you know, we, we don't keep moving. We don't keep uh, struggling. And in the end, I there's actually a lot going on for a simple story. There's... There's a lot of layers, and there's, you know, there's there's a lot of people who each have something they're trying to, you know, achieve. I guess the whole filmmaking process obviously is a lot of puzzle pieces that you have to find and put together and make this end product. Is finishing the script? What did it feel like when you finally said, you know, I think I'm gonna, it's done. To a point, it's never ever really done, right? But to where, like, oh, this is good. When did you feel like, oh, yeah. when, when you reached that point? And how big is that particular puzzle piece in the overall picture? So now everything else obviously is challenging. And what are those challenges? And but, but like, how big is the script? It's like, is that the okay? Now we got something. Now everything else we can just knock out. Or is it no, no? This is the first step. We you know, the first piece, of the foundation. There's a lot more to build. Yeah, kind of both of those things. Uh, on on the one hand, um, you, you don't have a movie unless you have a script, right? Yeah. Um, I was going to say, you know, when is it done? Um, well, I'm still tinkering with it. So Iron Man director uh, Jonathan Favreau said they didn't. Have, I keep hearing from filmmakers how they don't have scripts; they're just shooting. And I'm like, well, that seems like a really yeah, expensive I, way to make a film. I wouldn't do that. I wouldn't do that. That's a that's a really risky proposition. I mean, the, the only film that I can think of that turned out well, where they didn't know what the ending was, was Casablanca, uh -huh. and uh, and that was that was kind of they got a, kind of a lucky break. They could, they came up with a perfect ending to it, but while they were shooting. But that's not 
a recipe for success in filmmaking. I think you really want to have a pretty solid script. You know, tinkering with it is like I'm adding little details. I'm adding things that I thought of that that I want to shoot. That I, um, you know, when I talked to my DP, he said, "Write it in there because you'll forget it." And you know, just for his sake, I'm I'm going to do that. And he's probably right. In the thick of things, when you're in the middle of shooting, if it isn't there, you might go, "Crap! What was that other thing I wanted to do?" But but it, it's really important to have a, a really solid script before you ever start. So that is a very very big piece of the puzzle. And in this case, um, this the script is is honestly more valuable than I am because my name has no value. Uh, I can't go, you know. Craig Packard is going to make a film. Come on, everybody, get on board. Yeah. They, they go, who's that? I don't give a shit. But if they read the script and they go, this is cool, this is interesting, uh, I want to be a part of this, then you have something, and that has been the case. Um, my producer read it, and he loved it right from the get-go. He said he read it twice. And uh, you know, when we met to talk about it, he said, "I can't find anything wrong with it," and that doesn't usually happen. And he's right; there usually is something that that somebody wants to fix or change or or move or what have you. And uh, the fact that he saw the saw and valued the same movie that I wanted to make was huge, right? Um, and then. Pretty much every actor who's looked at it. Now, now, part of this is that actors want to do westerns, but but every actor who's read it has said, "Damn, I want to be in this," and that doesn't happen very often either. So that's that's pretty, you know, that feels good when people read it, and they get excited about it, and they want to help you get it made because they're not doing it as a favor to me. They're doing it because they see something for them in it, and that's great. I w I want them to. I want them to, I want people to see this and go, God, I want to be part of this because this is good for me. This is good for my reputation or this, and yeah. you know, this is a role that I've never had a chance to, to, you know, show that I could do. So, you know, that, that is a huge part of it, uh, especially in an indie film, um, because at, at some point, and, you know, we can get into talking about casting at some point, we'll bring in people, and then the people, you know, on the strength of their names, that they'll add another level of excitement that that my name doesn't isn't going to add. There was, uh, there was, uh, you know, it's twenty. Yeah, I, I, Band of Brothers. I'm sure you've seen that miniseries. Groundbreaking mm -hmm. in many ways. Incredible. Should be like required viewing. Came out 20 years ago this year, which blew my mind okay. when I heard that. I thought, wow. And they really, it just seemed like it wasn't that far away. And it's because the quality was so high. And they really pioneered that cinematic look and feel on a miniseries. And I think it was released on HBO at the time. Well, I was listening to a podcast. I think it was episode two, where they were interviewing the writer and the director. The director was this British guy, Long Crane, I think his name was. He was saying, mm. he said something interesting along the lines of filmmaking is, uh, is so hard and there's so much pain involved. And your brain just like when it's done, you supp it's you suppress all the pain and forget about how hard it was. So then you're like, oh, we should make another film again. And if, yeah. you, if you actually remembered how painful it was the first time, you'd never go want to do it again. Is do you feel like they that's say the same thing about childbirth? From what I understand, <laughs> no, I cannot speak to. Do you feel like that's true? Right. The thing the thing about making any kind of film, never mind making a good film, which is what we're trying to do. It's damn near impossible. But it's not quite impossible. It's just damn near impossible. And it feels like at every step of the way the whole damn thing could fall apart. And it could. And it, it can. I think we're at the point where I feel confident that we're going to get this movie done. <laughs> but for a long, long period of time. We started talking about making this about a year ago. And for about the first nine months I felt like it was going to fall apart at any minute. Why? That, that it's like you said, you need this to get that, but you also need that to get this. And, you know, 
sort of famously, you need a name actor to get the money, but you need money to get a name actor. Well, how do you do that? And the, the, the way you do it, it turns out, is you put one foot in front of the other, and you just keep making a little bit of incremental progress, and as long as everybody continues to believe in the project and believe in the story, believe in the script, believe that it's worthwhile, that it's worth bringing to life, then you can keep trudging on. And then, I mean, the weird thing is, I say the first nine months were, I felt like it, it could all fall apart, but because it hadn't really come together yet. But also, at the same time, I've had stroke of luck after stroke of luck after stroke of luck. And at some point, you feel like, I don't know, maybe it's a sort of benevolent delusion where you feel like this is destined, or this is inevitable, or damn it, we're, by God, we're going to get this thing done. The anxiety. It kills me. Just the experience. And everyone around me. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's, but yeah, you have to be a little bit mad to to attempt a thing like this. But isn't that true of anything big? That these big challenges can seem so daunting that we don't even try. And what a shame. What a shame to not even try. Yeah, I'm with you. It's the anxiety from the, it's the order of operations. I just, from the tech healthcare startup world. I think the challenges are very similar. I've always said movies are very similar to startups, except you guys get more money than we do. Yeah, you know, it, 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 it's insane. Well, think about it this way. Look, do you remember that movie District 9? If you yeah. watch the behind the scenes on that guy, I forgot his name right now. That's right. So he was like 23 or 24 or something. You know, they gave him like, here, kid, here's $30 million, make your movie. And he's just, it was something insane like that. It was like, he made a short film. He made a short film. And Peter Jackson saw it and said, this kid has talent. Let's give him, you know, a big Hollywood budget and see what he does with it. And he made, you know, District 9. But you mentioned, you mentioned Band of Brothers. Band of Brothers had Tom Hanks's yeah. production company, Playtone, behind it, which, you know, doesn't hurt. Steven Spielberg and have, Tom Hanks doesn't you know, hurt to have on that. Kind of the, yeah. the, the big levers of Hollywood to play with. However, money doesn't make a film. That's not, I mean, you need it, but it isn't the money that makes the film. And if you have unlimited money, I guess you could throw money at your problems, but I think it's you're better off solving the problems with creative solutions than relying on, you know, throwing money at it. Yeah. I think there's lots of films um, that could, that basically are proof points to that, that, that thesis for sure, where, where money wasn't the fix at all. We're sure. So what do you think? Especially lately. Yeah. Well, I'm curious to see what you think of this imagining of an epic book series, Dune, that's about to hit our shores here in a month or so. I have mixed feelings. What do you think? Do you think it's going to, do you think it's going to, I, I think if, I, I think he's a hell of a filmmaker, Denis Villeneuve, he's, he's terrific. What I've read of it doesn't, doesn't, doesn't excite me a whole lot, but you know, I, I read the book. I, I didn't hate uh, David Lynch's version of it. Okay. That was a long time ago, too. I mean, it, it probably doesn't hold up in terms of sci-fi, but I think it was true to the book. I, I also do not hate the David Lynch version, and you are the second person only in the last few months that I've talked about this with that agrees with me. So there's three of us now. And I feel like we <laughs> it, that, that deserves a Facebook group or something right. at least. It's like, hey, yeah, it wasn't that bad. So what is the one thing that you just, in your mind, has to be right for this bloody country to work as a great, not just story, but a great film? What's the thing that you're worried about the most and or concerned about just like we have to nail this one thing? Well, the, honestly, the hardest thing, the thing that, that fails more often than not is the script. And there are a lot of films uh, of every size that probably shouldn't have been made because they didn't know what story they were telling. So we already have that. I, I know very clearly what story I'm telling, and I know that it's a story worth telling. So I know at this point that I can go out and I could go out with non-professional actors and I could make a very good film. The only problem with that is that no one would see it. 
So the thing we have to get right is a really compelling and really interesting cast that will make people go, what is this? I want to see it. And then when they do see it, they will, they'll, hopefully they will feel like, wow, that was really cool. That was something I haven't seen before. And I'm still thinking about it after they watch it. Because those are the kind of films that I enjoy yeah. most. And, and in, in some cases, like No Country for Old Men, I'm still thinking about that movie. Right? Rear Window, I'm still thinking about that movie. Citizen Kane, I'm still thinking about that movie, right? I'm still trying to figure it out. Um, most of Kubrick's movies, I'm still, <laughs> still thinking about it, right? What are the last and, uh, five, ten years? What are the last five years? Have you, have you, you felt like you've seen something that elicits that recently? There's a, there's a film called Blue Ruin by a filmmaker, Jeremy Saulnier. That was made for less than half a million, no movie stars. It's basically a, a revenge story. And it's, to me, it's really compelling. It's really great filmmaking. And the only reason anybody knows about it is he submitted it to Cannes and it got in. And then suddenly, you know, he was on the map. And he's made a couple of films subsequent to that. I haven't seen them. There's one called Green Room that I'm, I'm really oh, just made kind that. Of like saving. I love that. Because I really, yeah, I want to savor it. And I, um, it's like I, it's like I want to, I don't know, it's like waiting to open your Christmas present or something like that. Like you want, you want the setting to be just right or something. No, I don't know. you do. And seeing um, Patrick Stewart is the bad guy. It's just like seeing know. Angela Lansbury is the, what is it, the Maltese Falcon or whatever she was in where she was like the evil one it's creepy oh from way back yeah yeah well yeah but you know patrick stewart could read the phone book <laughs> and it was he really could so i don't know what that voice when you're writing this now you're directing this obviously was that yeah. ever a question in your mind or when you were writing it you were like no no, no this has got to be me i know what i'm doing i, I, need, so, I have a vision here yeah, i mean originally like i said it was it was going to be this small thing and it was like golly gee let's go out and make a movie uh you know and and no i wasn't it was there was no point at which i was considering handing it to someone else i you know i've made several short films i made one no budget feature like 15 years ago uh, you know a bunch of directed a bunch of music videos i'm very comfortable with with working with actors working with working with the camera working with all the millions of questions you have to answer sometimes simultaneously in fact, I, to me, you know, I, I, in some ways I think of myself as a writer first, but the directing is the fun part. It really is. It's the part where you feel like you're, you know, you're using 100% of your brain all the time. And it's exhausting, and it's, but it's, it feels great. So, yeah, I, there was never any point where, where I considered giving it away or selling it or anything like that. I, no interest. And I'm, in fact, if somebody offered me a uh, million dollars to, to buy the script, I'd say, no, I'm, we're making this. Put your money in the production. That's dedication, but, man. Do you believe Do you believe in yourself? And that's what I wanted to actually dig into a little bit because you talked about the experience you've had, which I'm sure is full of things that have gone well and things that have gone not so well. Can you talk about that? What was it like coming up, directing music videos, doing that feature? What what were times when, what did you do in those times you're like, I'm not sure if I can do this? Or maybe you didn't have that. I mean, did you ever have imposter syndrome or feel like you were in uh, over your head? So <laughs> I, I directed a, a short film that I also wrote, gosh, almost exactly 10 years ago. And it's called Bobby Ellis is going to kick your ass. It's a short film that it, it won an award from the slam dance screenplay competition. So I was like, okay, I got to make this movie now. And at the time, I think I was I was kind of done with making short films because they they it doesn't matter how good they are they just nothing ever comes of them. But you know I was going into this with this pretty substantial award, and it had been a little while since I'd made something, and we it took a while because we had to shoot it in a school, we needed a school bus, we needed a lot of kids as extras, a cast of you know actual high school kids. Um, there were a lot of moving parts for a short film, and I raised a significant amount of money for for a short film. Which, by the way, I don't recommend putting a lot of money into a short film. What's a lot it's, of money? What's the? Well, this was about twenty five grand 
for a ten minute film, which really isn't a ton of money. If you if you factor that out, that's that's half million dollar feature film, or maybe a two hundred fifty thousand dollar feature film, or something like that. It's not a ton, but it's a lot to spend on a short film where the the opportunities to get your money back are slim and or none. But we put all the pieces into place, and I do very distinctly remember the night before shooting, thinking to myself, do I even remember how to... Who the hell said I was a film director? What the... What kind of a silly notion is that? I'm, 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 I don't even know. What am I... Where do you put the camera? And the funny thing is, so I have this way of working where... As a rule, as a general rule, I start with something easy because I've been on other people's film sets where there's a 6 a.m. call time and it's noon and nobody's done anything and the camera hasn't even been run and it's just a really irresponsible way to treat people's time and their work and their excitement and all that sort of thing. So I have a, a general rule that we start with something simple just to get people moving, get the nerves out, get to get the camera going, get get the crew jumping, you know? And uh, we, my DP, who's the same DP on this feature, Ryan, uh, Ryan Purcell, we didn't know each other at the time. And I, I, the first thing we shot was a sequence of about three shots. And he made a suggestion he said, how about we do a little crowd on this? And I was like, cool, let's do it. And by the end of that three sequence, that three shot sequence, three setups, I was like, I'm in the saddle, baby. And I feel good. And there was no doubt anymore. And I knew that I could work with this DP, that he was somebody who he had ideas and he knew that I would listen to his ideas. And I wasn't always going to be like, yeah, you sh you direct this movie. I wasn't going to do that. But I, I was going to listen to him, and if he had a good idea, I was definitely going to use it. I wasn't going to th feel threatened by him. and So that that felt like a really comfortable co collaboration, and we're off to the races. Have I had things go wrong? <laughs> Absolutely. And that is almost the, the nature of indie filmmaking is shit goes wrong, and what do you do? And in a way, that's part of the fun of it. Uh, in some cases, it's not fun until you yeah, think it's back retrospectively on it, fun. Well, yeah, it's happening. Yeah, it's it's really stressful. But you got to come up with a creative solution to to the problems that come up, or you. Uh, the very first film I ever did, we, I bought a camera for this thing, which mm -hmm. was a pretty pretty expensive, one of the couple of. HD cameras that were any good that you could buy at the time. And for some idiotic reason that to this day I do not understand, there was a way where you could put the ba battery in backwards and if you did it, it fried the... Oh, thing. yeah. Yeah, it, it blew a fl fuse is what it did and the camera was dead. Deader than dead. It was a paperweight. And my my... I guess co-producer's wife, trying to be helpful, took the battery that was charging, put it in wrong. She didn't know she put it in wrong. It doesn't actually click in if you put it in wrong, but you could touch the, the leaves. You know, the, yeah. And you touch them backwards, not so good. And you brought it to set. Can't, I turned it on. Nothing happened. It took a little while for us to figure out what happened. And we had we were we were in Washington. We had it that day get up to Vancouver. We a lot of time on the phone, and then we finally found somebody who said, yeah, I think we can fix it, We're gonna have, but we have to open it up, and we have to solder in a new fuse, and it's going to be a oh you know, my blew the whole day. And, and I thought, well, you know, there was a moment when, when we realized we didn't have a working camera where I just thought, well, well, we are screwed. Screwed. We're just, that's it. We're done. We're done. There's there's nothing to be done. And thankfully, I had a partner on that who who was like, "Well, no, no, no. We're not done. We're going to we're going to we're going to fix this. We're going to find a way. There's always a way, right? There's got to be a way." And you know, pulled me off the floor. And that's kind of what the value of a team is really in in this kind of scenario where something goes wrong, somebody quite possibly just loses it. Yeah. And they need somebody else to go, hold on, hold on, we're not done yet. We are not done. 
we're going to figure this out. And you take a moment, you pull yourself together, and you find the solution. And that's just what you do. And sometimes I'm the guy on the floor, and sometimes I'm the person pulling somebody else off the floor. And that's that's the value of having a, a really good team of people who are, you know, trying to, who, who really believe in the, in the idea and want to see it fulfilled. And it's not just one person dragging everybody along. Yeah, well, it's so. it's interesting. Yeah, it's like the definition of an expert is someone who's failed every way possible. Right? So <laughs> it's like you get to this level yeah. and you you've just been through the different failure modes, and you know it's going to yeah. be okay. And if it isn't, like you go through that together too, which is reassuring. What are you as a filmmaker, as a director? I'm sure that every time you go through a, or execute on a project, you're learning something. Or you want to learn something. What is your goal? What do you want to learn through this process? What do you want to make sure that you, what, what do you think you're going to really pick up in terms of skills as a director, as a writer? How do you want to grow through this bloody country? It's hmm. an interesting question. I, well, you know, I mean, a feature, a feature is a, more than anything, it's a bigger, you know, it's a bigger box of tools and a bigger crew and it's more things to keep going so on a, a certain level it's I want to see how I handle that and at the same time you know I heard a, a pretty experienced and accomplished film director say when I make movies now it's no different than when I was a kid making them on the video camera or whatever it, it's really and he said it sounds like I'm joking, but I'm not. It's it really is the same thing. It's there's more there's more lights around. There's more people standing around. There's more people to do the things that you would have done yourself. Um, but you're really doing the same basic stuff. So for me, it's you know each time you do that, you sort of uh, that that groove in your brain or that that sense of confidence gets stronger. And you know I. I I want to I want to tackle something that is that, that feels like a real um, like a real grown up movie that I I'm just I don't see a lot of them anymore that that I I anyway am kind of yearning and I guess I'm taking it on myself to to put some of that out there so yeah I want to make a what I think of as a like, serious cinema and something worthy of, you know, and I guess if I'm dreaming, something that goes into the Criterion Collection or something like that. You know, I, I'm, that's what I'm shooting for. I, I told a friend who read the script and really liked it, I said, I don't want to make good movies. I want to make great movies. And that sounds arrogant or, doesn't you know, something. But, but how are you going to get to what you want if you don't know what you want and it's not because i i want people to think i'm great it's but if i'm going to do this i, I want to shoot for greatness i want to shoot for something that's really quality yeah it doesn't sound unreasonable or anything it sounds ambitious but i think why else would you even do something what, what would you be aiming for yeah. why not why not you why not the criterion collection I mean, I think the first time I made a film, I just wanted to make a film that looked like a film. And I was pretty happy with the fact that I made a film that looked like a real film. But that's the bar for me is it is at another level now. Definitely. I guess. So this team, Craig, where are you with the team? What are you looking for with respect to the, the members of the crew and the cast? But also, what are the pieces you need to make this happen? So let's see, we have, we've got a LA based producer, um, Yuri Cole, uh, whom you've met obviously. And I've got my sort of producing partner, Ann Byler. Uh, we've got a, uh, a DP that I've worked with. He'll bring his camera team to bear, mostly out of Seattle. Yuri will bring most of the production design team 
out of L.A. is sort of what we're thinking. It is going to be a pretty pretty lean production. We, through our lawyer, a just fantastic location in southern Utah near Kanab, just south of Bryce Canyon National Park. Gorgeous and, part of the uh, world. Just, just fantastic. I mean, really, it's just sort of point the camera anywhere. That is going to take some logistics because it is kind of in the middle of nowhere. They have cabins, but... You know, we, we, it's not like, it's not like a hotel. It's not, we're not going to bring a whole moving village of, of trailers out there. Uh, that would be a lot of money that, of questionable value. We have a casting director, a very good one that by the man, by the name of Mark Tillman, who's, who's been doing it for a long time and has a lot of really good connections with, with agencies and stuff. I gave him some names of people that I was interested in. There were some where he was like, that's going to be difficult. And then there were some where he was like, I know some people. And he's made some contacts with some of the people that, that and, and got some interest. And so there's, we are, we're looking to shoot it in, in the spring at this point, partly because six months ago, we, we hoped we'd be shooting it in the fall, but we also hoped the rest of the country would get vaccinated and for some reason they didn't get the memo. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, that complicated things more than I, I anticipated. And then, you know, like anything, it's, it's fundraising. And, uh, I would say at this point we've raised about, I want to say about a third of, of our kind of mid range budget. And I think I see a path to getting there. It's a, it's a tall mountain, but I like, like any of them, we take it one step at a time. How do people get involved with you when they want to learn more, contribute, maybe help out, or give resources? How do they find? How do they get? How do they get a hold of you? Sure, they could get a hold of me directly, or through you, or you could put up my information at the end of this. Yeah, definitely. We have we have a newsletter that we've been sending out every couple of weeks that sort of tracks our progress and that's a nice way for the people who are helping and who just are curious to see what goes into it and most recently we we you probably saw it we we hinted at a, at a particular actor who has said he would be willing to come in and make a cameo there's a there's a small role where i from the beginning i, I wanted a recognizable face and this person definitely fits the bill it's very cool. See? But through our casting director, somebody who he's worked with a number of times says he's a really great person to work with. And for, yeah, he'll, definitely a recognizable face. Um, yeah, see, but, you, 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 know, you were very it, humble uh, about your name and not, be, not being that recognizable. It will be. It looks like you're onto something and you're able to collaborate. It's like the human superpower. We only have so many superpowers. I think one of them is collaboration, right? It's how you get movies made or pyramids built. Um, yeah, for sure. It's doing that, which, which I just – this project seems amazing. To be able to be part of it in any way is, is a privilege just to see and learn how the sausage is made on a medium that, that's so important that I enjoy personally but also is impactful to the world, which is filmmaking in general. But I just think there are so many people either watching this, listening to this, watching something similar, thinking about projects like this – and they just don't take that next step. It's, it seems like a humongous step outside their comfort zone, outside of something they've done before. Maybe they've been to film school, but now they're working on something else. What do you tell those people? How do you inspire the next generation of filmmakers, that person to pick up the camera or to have them stop letting perfection be the enemy of good, just create something, just start? What do you... Well, that's... that's yeah, that's a big question. But, well, for one, I think most people, whether they want to make films or not, they they love films. And you can't go out and make them yourself. Well, lucky you know somebody who can. And I used to think, I used to, in my head, when we started this process, when I, when I thought about asking people for money, I thought, I'm asking for something. But at the further we go along in this, I realize, no, I'm offering something. I'm offering an opportunity for people to be a part of something that is going to be really cool. I, I, I am asking for something of them, but in a way, it's like 
that's the easy part. Write a check, you know. I'm not asking you to come out and make the movie, unless you want to. But that would that would be a longer conversation. But people who love movies want to see good movies. And, and imagine, you know, some film you love before it was made. You didn't know anything about it, and somebody had come to you and said, "Hey, you can you help us make this movie?" And you had said no, and then you saw the movie and you loved it, and you thought, "Damn it, I missed it out." Yeah. On getting in on that, and I this could have been a thing that for the rest of my life I I would be like I was a part of this. Yeah. I helped make that happen. You know, name the name the movie you love, and imagine that you could have been a part of that. Your name could have been attached to that in some way, even in some small way where you just you could tell your grandkids, "You see this movie." I help make this happen. You know? It is a weird for real. It is. It's, I wonder if you have to. If you ever wake up and just pinch yourself sometimes, because even when it's the times are tough, it's what you do, Craig. Is it, it's like a, there's a small class of jobs. It's like the the airplane seat effect. When you sit down next to somebody in an airplane, and you're waiting to take oh, off, sure, and you yeah. go, "What do you do? What do you do?" And it's like I work with dolphins. I'm a surgeon. I'm an astronaut. <laughs> I'm a filmmaker. And people are like, tell me more. Yeah. And it's, it's not just a, that's cool. It strikes some chord in their brain, which is like some regret, right? It's like, oh, I've always wanted to do that and I never did. And the, you can tell when they stop talking to you because they look, they look, they're like, oh, that's cool. And they look away. <laughs> and and, yeah, and yeah. you're like, yeah. You could still do it. It's so, it's so a lot of people I, have these dreams, and they just didn't have the opportunity or weren't able to seize on an opportunity through no fault of their own. Sometimes just to do it. So you're definitely in the category of things where you wake up. I, I think it's uh, it's like the get to versus have to category. And I, have to, I there's a point on any any just about anything I've shot, no matter how big or small, where I just stop and I turn to the people in the crew and I go, can you believe it? We're making a, we're making a movie. How cool is that? Yeah. Most people will never get to do this in their whole yeah. life. It, no matter, no matter how small the, you know, or insignificant this production is, most people will never do this. People are sitting in their cubicles right now, arguing over a stapler or something, <laughs> whatever people do, business people. <laughs> you know. say that in a way where you've, do you, you, you've definitely run the other direction from that lifestyle all your life. <laughs> <laughs> the, the and I, I have no, I have no, I have no disdain for people who, who make whatever choices they had to make in life or, or wanted to make in life. They, life is a complicated thing, and the world's a complicated place, and it needs architects and accountants and all the other people that make things happen. And they have no disdain for anybody. And still, there's a, there's a kind of, this is just awesome that we get to do yeah. this. Factor that at some point it's worth mentioning to people like don't take this for granted that a lot of people never get a chance to do this and even though and yeah not always fun but there's and it's not even about fun i'm not there to have fun but there's a kind of a, a thrill to it for sure it is a it is a pinch yourself moment i, mean, I remember in medical school scrubbing into a neurosurgery case and there's someone's brain just sitting in front of me less than a foot away and i was uh I was like, this is cool. Is, it, is anyone seeing this? And they're like, shut up, kid. We're busy. It was, and it's, I always used to wonder, do they just get, it was until later when I became a practicing doctor and I was like, oh yeah, that you can, you can get stuck in the grind in such a way where you're just like next shot, next patient, next edit, whatever. You know, it's like, oh, I have to pinch myself and be like, I don't have to do this. I get to do this. Like I get to do it. Right. And that's, so I'm really glad that you instill that, I think in the team and that it really lifts people up that that level of gratefulness and awareness and this seems super exciting and i want to like literally really want to see the finished product like i want to see this movie what's like the give me the best case scenario like when filming post-production what are you aiming for oh man i feel weird talking about best case scenario because it, it feels uh like i don't know dangerous but you know i think a sundance or a can um premiere would be fabulous and and then we make a sale our uh investors make all their money back and then some ideally which i think is my permission to get 
get on to the next movie and, uh, and people see it and respond to it and continue to think about it. That's really it. And then the Criterion Collection. No, no, small. Things. Those are good goals. Big goals are good goals. Big things are good goals too. This is awesome, Craig. I'll definitely put the information that links to how people can get a hold of you, and definitely that newsletter is the way to go to make sure to for, for anybody who's interested, just keeping up to date on a cool project and to see the whole process. And all are welcome. Why not come along on the journey and, and see what it's like? Because I, I don't know how often people get a window into this sort of thing. For me, yeah. it's it's. Maybe a little more commonplace because I have other filmmaker friends, but I, a lot of people, for a lot of my friends, I'm the only filmmaker they know. And I imagine that's true for a lot of people who will see this. And you are welcome to join in. Oh, that sounds incredible. Let's do this again uh, once, you know, I'm sure you'll have news and this will be post, you'll be in post production or something. I'd love to catch up again and just uh, let everyone know how things went and update timelines and schedules. And I'm sure you'll have even more stories to tell of the process. What do you say? Yeah, we can do a nice before and after. There you go. Include this in the criterion yeah, collection we'll behind the scenes. See if my, uh, see if my mood has changed any. <laughs> You know, six months. Put a wearable on you. Get your get your blood pressure and anxiety level. And yeah, yeah, we. I, I think I think once the thing is in in the can, we'll be on to different things, and I will be ecstatic to have it to have it shot and have it moving moving into post production and all that. It's a different. It's a different. Um, you know, it's a different and also difficult part of the process. They say that the film is written three times, once when it's written, once when it's directed, and once when it's edited. So I'm handling at least two two pieces of that. Uh, you, you're juggling a lot of balls. So that is Craig Packard, writer and director of uh, pre-production, fair to say, This Bloody Country, indie yep. film, coming soon. Deep into pre-production. Deep into pre-production. Deep pre-production. Yes. Pre deep. Pre well, well, thank you so much for your time, and uh, we'll catch up. All right. Thanks for having of me. Of course. All right.